If you or someone you know is struggling with alcoholism or addiction, do not hesitate to reach out for help. You can find numerous free resources on our website, thebeginagainpodcast.com, and there are tons of resources and support networks available online, in person, or just a phone call away. You don't have to face this challenge alone. Welcome to the Begin Again Podcast. I'm your host, Gary Menkes. On the Begin Again Podcast, we delve into the inspiring journeys of individuals who have overcome alcoholism and addiction and emerged as true trailblazers in entrepreneurship, business, sports, and beyond. Through authentic, uplifting, and profound conversations with our guests, we aim to shatter the stigma surrounding addiction and demonstrate that recovery can be a catalyst for remarkable success, strength, and resilience. We firmly believe that by listening to these accounts, you will be empowered to unlock your own potential, instigate positive change in your life, and contribute to the creation of a better world. So, get ready to be inspired and embark on your own personal journey of growth with the Begin Again Podcast. Welcome back to the Begin Again Podcast. I'm your host, Gary Menkes, and joining us today is fitness enthusiast, public speaker, entrepreneur, and host of the Chasing Heroin podcast, Janine Coulter. Janine was an active drug addict and alcoholic for 15 years. Her using led to multiple arrests, homelessness, and loss of absolutely everything, which she considers to be the best thing that ever happened to her. Sober since January 15th, 2015, and now a successful fitness studio owner and entrepreneur, Janine recovers out loud and is committed to sharing her story to help and inspire others, which I know for certain she does because myself included. Janine, thanks for being here. Welcome to the show. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. I need to update that bio, though. I'm not an owner anymore. I'm the manager. And you're, and there's also, uh, you're also working on another podcast. We do need to update a little yes, bit. Yes, yes. We'll talk and, about with our other yeah. friend, Marlene, who's, uh, she's, yeah. she and I she's awesome. Know. Yeah. How are you? Well, I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me. We Like we were saying off air, freaking third time's the charm. Yes. Uh, but it all works out, you know, like. And, and I was telling him too. So I had to cancel twice at the last minute. And I was like, this guy is going to think I'm such a train wreck and be like, how is she getting on these other shows? She can't. And I'm like, no, no, no I promise you're the only person that's ever happened with. So thank you for giving me another chance. No, please. please. <laughs> and, I, and I was happy when you did, because I was laughing to myself and no, I have been watching. I knew you, how much you care about this and how much this right. is part of your life. So I never once thought that at all. Okay, I didn't, we're all kind of all sporadic. We're all in our own, you know, running all around with chickens or, but you had some real things that happened while you had the cancel too. Like there was a, right. That's true. Yeah, that's true. Anyway, anyway I'm pr- I'm glad you're here. Thank you. We talked for a half hour offline, which is, which is good and which is rare, but um, I don't know. Take us back. Take it away a little bit for us. How'd you get here? Huh. <laughs> I, it's a long way. Um, So yeah. my story is not, I always start, typically by saying that my story is not one that you would think typically would result in somebody becoming a heroin addict, because I feel like there's a lot of stereotype when you see someone that's a homeless heroin addict for years and who's in and out of jail. My last arrest was for strong arm robbery and I was going to go to prison and get a strike. It was a violent offense. Like when you see that, you typically think, oh, this person must have been in foster care or abused at home or something has happened. And that was not the case for me at all. I had an amazing upbringing. I have amazing parents. Like if I could go back and do it again and choose my parents, I would choose them again, both of them, which I wouldn't have thought that about my mom until I got older. <laughs> but now <laughs> I love her. Now I can value what she did. That's cool. Um but they were great. You know, my dad's a pilot. He's retired now, but he's a pilot. And my mother's a social worker. She's a master's degree. And they loved each other and they loved us. They did end up getting divorced when I was older, but they loved each other very much. They had a great relationship. They were friends. They loved me and my brother. We had this great upbringing. You know, we lived in a place called Peachtree City, which is this like idyllic little town in Georgia where you drive golf carts everywhere. And I was clear growing up that I could go wherever I wanted for college. My parents constantly told me that I was good at sports and I was a good gymnast and I was a good actress. And my mom signed me up for Nancy Drew camp, detective camp in fourth grade because I, yeah, because I loved Nancy Drew, which is so cool too, by the way. Like when I think about it now, I don't know if they still do that. We were living in Cincinnati, Ohio for a year, actually speaking of Cincinnati, we've spoken about that off here. 
um, they did a little detective camp where you went on Saturday and you solved a mystery and it was so fun yeah, and nice. stuff like that, stuff that my parents let me, you know, I, I debated in high school and I was really good and they would send me over the summer to the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor for three weeks to go to debate camp, which was really expensive so that I could do well during the year so that I could get into a good college, which I did. All the things yeah. were in place for me to be a well-functioning adult <laughs> And, but I wasn't, um, and fun stuff, Nancy drew camp sounds fun. I gotta say, I think my daughter would love that. I still remember the, the, how it, like the, um, the actual case it was, yeah. it, but what I will say is, so there was a little cafe also that you had to go in to interview the cafe person that worked there, but they gave you a brownie when you interviewed <laughs> and I kept going back to get the brownie and pretending I had more questions for the cafe owner. Right. And finally, the third time they were like, okay, Janine, you've gotten the information that you need from the cafe owner. You need to move on with your case. That's too funny. That's great. Yeah. I, I can relate to that. There, we used to have an ice cream man that came around the neighborhood, right? And on your birthday, you would get a free ice cream, right? And I was like, you know, six years old. And I heard this and I was like, every week I was like, hey, it's my birthday. And he was awesome. He was like, all right, Gary, here you go. And then like third week, he's like, you know, it's, it's been your birthday three weeks in a row now. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, he caught me. Like that's how young it was. But so I can get that. So anyway, sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt him. Back to but you. But you know what though? That's like early manipulation tactics. So, right? cause oh, here's what I think. An inch, like, I'll, I'll take, I'll take it all. Right. Totally. <laughs> and I'm going to figure out a way yeah. where the rules don't apply to me. And cause I spent a lot of time looking back and wondering based on my upbringing, how did all of this happen? And mm. I believe that addiction is part of a larger personality trait. And we, you know, as I got older and I learned more about addiction, I've learned so many things that are a part of this personality trait and these character traits, like the rules don't apply to me. Mm -hmm. And I was a big, the rules don't apply to me person. And yeah. I navigated life well enough that I didn't get in trouble. I went to school and I didn't cheat and I, you know, did the things I needed to do in school. Like I never got in trouble, but in a lot of ways, I absolutely felt that the rules didn't apply to me. When I got older, I was I was late for high school every single day after I got my car. But the reason I was late is every single day, no matter what, I went through the Chick-fil-A drive through first to get a giant Coke mm -hmm. and a butter biscuit. And uh -huh. even if I was late, I didn't care. And I did smoke cigarettes. That is the one thing I did that was like, quote, bad in high school. I'd be smoking yep. cigarettes in the Chick-fil-A drive through late, not caring at all. And other people are like trying to get to homeroom on time. And I was like, fuck it. I don't care, dude. And yeah. I would show up late and I would park in the handicap space and run inside <laughs> because I didn't care, you know, yeah. and then I would go move my car after like stuff like that, that, that could also just be chalk it up to being a, a teenager, but I did it all the time in yeah. every way. I never believed that consequences should apply to me. Even when I got to college later, same thing with parking. I would park wherever I wanted and then never pay the parking tickets. I didn't yeah. care, um, you know, same, I mean, in, you know, I had a box full of Nassau community college parking tickets like really i didn't want to go to that school anyway you know and then so many times i just drive out sit in the parking lot for 10 minutes and then like go to mcdonald's and you know spend the hour there and then turn back home and say i was at i was at i did i did college today yeah but i didn't want to do it either i didn't want to do it either so to. and in fact one of the most inconvenient things i found to be so inconvenient but no one else did so i first went to school in dc i did get into a good college and i will say that when my parents split up is when everything really did nosedive so i had this idyllic childhood but when they split up i lost my mind i, I How lost old my you mind when they split up 17. that's tough like it's really you know it's a weird everything age everything is coming at you at 17 right you're yeah. really find yourself and find things and find other things that probably yeah. all right that's a you know and then and it was surprising no one expected it. Really? They got along. Really, no, not at all. No one. So it threw us for a loop a lot yeah. by us. I mean, me and my brother. So we both just kind of imploded our lives yeah. voluntarily. He quit playing baseball. My brother was really, really good. My dad played at Florida State and my brother wow. was supposed to play at Florida State. He already knew the coaches. They're like really good at baseball. At and baseball. Danny, you know, he quit. Um, 
I don't know if you can it, tell about baseball. I could. I was going to ask you, do you play or you're a super I fan? Because you look I, like a baseball player. I, Your whole I, vibe I, is very I, baseball player. Very base, I, I love baseball. It's my sport. Yeah. yeah. I played one year at junior college. Again, I did okay. everything wrong. I didn't go to school proper. You know, I, I thought yeah. I was there to play baseball. That was a fun semester. Let me tell you. We, did mm-hmm. it. we yeah. went to the junior college world series, though. I did play in the junior college world series. That was. Oh, a, that's awesome. A highlight. And, you know, I came back and they're like, Gary, you haven't been in class all all semester i'm like oh yeah you know <laughs> you know i didn't i don't think i i thought of things like rules don't apply to me but i am i was wired janine and, and i still am almost um uh, to be honest like if you tell me something like i don't like like if you tell me to go this way i'm wired to go the other yeah. way i am just yeah. that overly stubborn you know i was and, and i i just bring that up because how you yeah described how you know you've done a lot of research on addiction yeah. and personalities and it's the second time today i was speaking to someone earlier they brought up usage history and they really went back and sort of started writing down their usage history and i was like wow that's interesting maybe that's something that i should do and you kind of touching upon it yourself going back and doing some of your own you know reflection Yeah. So that's, and I didn't think of it as the rules don't apply to me either back then. It wasn't until later when I heard that term that I thought, oh, I have always been like that because my friends paid parking tickets. My friends got to school on time and I didn't, but it's interesting that you say that you're wired to go the other way. My husband is like that. If you tell him to do something, he's going to do the opposite. Still, he's 37. He'll (laughs) still do it. So annoying. But I didn't necessarily think I'm going to, purposely do what you didn't say. So I'm wondering if there's some like gender relation here too, if it manifests in different way in action, what I would think is, okay, I'm still going to do the end result, but not the hard way that you just said. I understand that you just told me the right way, but I'm going to do it the easy way and show you that it can be done a different way because you're a sucker and I'm not a sucker. (laughs) So I'm going to be 50 in July. So, and I don't think it gets better. So that's just kind of a warning. Maybe, I don't know if your husband's going to get a, maybe he will. He's learned the hard way. So he just had a gnarly, he has six months now, but he had a horrific relapse for like a year and a half. It's been like the hardest time of our life and marriage. I think that's probably one of the, I don't remember what exactly was happening when I had to cancel the first time, but he just now has six months and he was, it was really bad. He was missing in Mexico for two months. I didn't know where he was. Like I was looking up, like, how do I divorce a missing person? Like, I don't know where he is. I can't serve him papers. Thank God he's back now. He has six months. He's doing really, really, really well now for the, for the first time in a while. I'm very proud of him. Got a great new job that he just started this week doing step work, finished his 12th step on Sunday with his sponsor, raising his hand to sponsor, going to men's meetings, all the things that I have been saying to do for years. So I think he now is, he learned the fucking hard way yeah, to do, yeah. but I'm sure it will come up in smaller, less consequential ways. Because like you said, I think that sometimes you're just like wired for these things. But so I got into this good school, lost my mind, quit, whatever, went to the University of Georgia. And what what was so inconvenient to me was that I had to drive to a parking garage and then take a bus to the building on campus. Really? And I thought that that was the most ridiculously inconvenient thing that I ever fucking heard of. I was like, I don't want to go anyway. You're telling me I need to leave 45 minutes early also? I don't want to get on this bus yeah no and so but like everybody else did quite common at state schools to take a bus i think that they're kind of all like that because you know eighty thousand people go there whatever and so everyone else did it except for me so things like that and again when i learned that later because for a long time i blamed so i didn't start doing heroin until i was 30 which is really stupid to pick up a heroin app habit at 30 years old and so for a long time i blamed the the guy that introduced me to heroin yeah. And I had to get really honest later right. and look back at my life and the ways that my choices aligned with addict choices long before I met him. Mm-hmm. And that was one of the ways that looking back, it became clear to me. I also started having food issues at that time too, binge eating, excessive exercise, obsessed with weight loss. To me, that was really my first addiction when I learned more about it. That was when I moved into the area of problematic behaviors or maladaptive behaviors to change the way that I felt. Interesting. And I was on the university of Georgia campus last year. I went to 
Oh, the, were you? Yeah, we went to the U, uh, Tennessee Bulldogs. Uh, Tennessee at Tennessee. It actually, was number one versus number two. It hasn't happened in like ages, and we just we won that them. game. Crushed them, crushed them that game. For yeah, thirty-eight sure. seventeen. Was it? Which there you go. yes. I, I the it. only reason I know that. Let's double check. The only reason I know that I'm not actually some like sports fanatic, although that'd be super cool if I just knew that offhand, is because on my story, my Instagram story the other day, I did an Ask Me Anything. Uh -huh. And someone said, no questions, just a comment, go Vols, boo, Georgia. And I went and screenshotted the game, the final, and posted it. And I think it was 38-17. I just looked at it Saturday. That's why I know that. And so I posted it and was like, I'm just going to leave this right here. Oh. So that's why I know. Nothing more yeah. needs to be said. Yes, exactly. So, so anyways. Anyway, so I do want to, I want to hear how he got here, but I do... I guess we'll get to it, but I want to see, you know, you started doing work on yourself. It was interesting. You just said that, you know, you started looking back, you blame the guy for so long until yeah. you started looking at yourself. Right. And that's what we learn in recovery. That's what I learned. Right. It's yeah. the first time you ever start doing work on me. Like I say this all the time, like writing, writing a, a list down, you know, a mm -hmm. step forward list, four, a fourth step list and all the stuff that happened to me or all the stuff that I had did and shared it with another man is like, that was not, part of like you know the usual you know on the radar like this is uh this is normal like every instinct in my body even before that even before doing the step work like if some stranger came up and said hey man i know you're struggling you know if i was in the rooms and you know here's my number call me tomorrow like every instinct in my body is like what do you mean call me you know take your right. number you, you know you don't know who you're talking to you know beat it right, right? but it wasn't right. until i gave up and i surrendered and i, I yeah. realized that i don't know it anything like everything yes. i've been trying because i was in and out for four years janine and I, I went to rehab in 2002 my sobriety dates 2006 four years it was just a total absolute disaster of in and out and um but you had said you started doing the work and you start looking at yourself right a little more how, how was that tell us how how that came about i mean you must so, always be in sobriety yeah so same thing as you i started the first meeting i went to was in 2008 my mm. sobriety date is 2015. Yeah. So there was also a long time for me of trying to do it in any my way. Right. Because again, I can do things the smarter, faster, easier way because I'm not a sucker and you're a sucker and 12 steps seems like it's for suckers. And right. I'm not going to sit in a basement with you on a Friday night. I'm cooler than that. I'm cooler than that. Yeah. In fact, I remember one night, the night of the presidential election 2008, which was also my boyfriend's birthday we had split up but we were like kind of trying to work it out and we had split up because i was doing cocaine all the time and so he had like kicked me out of the house yeah. and it was 2008 it was the night that obama won and he won in a landslide they called it really early and i was in an aa meeting in la because by then i lived i'd moved to la so i didn't graduate from georgia i ended up deciding that i wanted to be an actress instead of graduating college and so at 22 i drove myself to la alone also, delusions of grandeur rules don't apply to me. I really thought that I would just be a famous actress yeah. and not have to drive and take the bus to campus. Right. I was like, I would rather be famous than yeah. get on this bus. So I'm going to just go do that instead. And right. obviously, making it as an actress is a lot harder than getting a college degree, like a lot. Right. Yeah. So I'm in LA by now and had picked up a gnarly cocaine habit as well along the way. So also I had to be honest about later, I only met the guy that introduced me to heroin because the guy in LA had made me leave because I was doing cocaine. Like a drug problem got me to San Diego, which is how I met him. So I, the first, I, the night that Obama won the election, I remember leaving an AA meeting and people were pouring out of bars, like cheering, right? It's LA. Everybody wanted Obama to win, right? Sure. So everybody's like pouring out of bars, cheering. And I remember thinking, this is my life. I was in that stupid meeting while you guys were having fun and right. I was in a meeting and this is my life now. I will right. never be a part of society again. I'm right. a fucking loser. And I wouldn't, I was not willing. And now what I didn't see then is that the society that is available in recovery is amazing and so right. fun and the coolest people I've ever met in my life. But of course right. I didn't know that yet. Right. Yeah. And so yeah. I, I thought I don't want to be disconnected. So it took me a long time also of going in and out and in and out and in and out and in and out. And then I was homeless for the first time at 31 mm -hmm. and didn't stop until 35. And so from 31 to 35, I was homeless 
or in a program or in sober livings, but I never had any sort of a stable foundation through that entire time. So, but, and it's interesting that you asked that. I just spoke at a recovery center opening recently, and I had never spoken about treatment before. Mm -hmm. And all of the realizations that I had as a direct result of going into rehab and hearing different things at different facilities. And that's when I started to do the work on myself. It was forced upon me by these facilities. And that's why I also think that, you know, relapse felt like such a failure. You know, you feel like such a failure. Everybody else is doing it. You show up in a meeting with six days and the guy that you went in with has four years. It's yeah. horrible, you yeah. know, and I was in that cycle for a long time, but I was learning every time. And this is actually what I shared about when I, when I spoke at the facility. So yeah. the first thing that blew my mind was the first detox that I went to in 2011. First meeting I went to was in 2008. Went to a detox in 2011 to detox. At that point, I was strung out on heroin. Mm. And I got there telling everyone, I'm not really an addict. I accidentally got strung out on heroin. I didn't know it made you sick. And I've just been an addict for 10 months, but I'm not like an addict addict. I drank and I did Coke my whole life and it was fine. And as soon as I get off heroin, like I'm good. I've only been an addict for 10 months. I've only been an addict for 10 months. I'm telling everybody this. And I go to detox and they made me do a step one to like graduate or something. You know, it's like a week. And then they get you, they give you that rock that says like faith on it or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So to get my rock, I had to finish step one and it was a timeline and I wrote my timeline and I saw that I have not been an addict for 10 months. And it was, it was a history of usage, like you just said. So the way they had us do it was what was the first substance you used? Anything, even the light stuff, which for me would be cigarettes at 16. I think I smoked weed once too. And then, you know, at 21, I'm doing cocaine for the first time. And then you also write the consequences, right? Like your basic step one. Right. And then by 31, I'm smoking heroin off of tinfoil and homeless. And when you look at the usage and the consequences, it became clear to me that, oh, I haven't been an addict for 10 months. I've been an addict for 12 years. Yeah. And that was the first moment of work. on. But I don't stop for another four years because though those moments would go in briefly, yeah. there was always a really easy way out of it. You know, but what I've also learned is that addiction is progressive and fatal and mine was progressive. And, and so what that showed me was just how progressive it was, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so that was the first time I kind of started to work on it. And. Right after that, I got to my first residential rehab and I remember I turned 32 in mm. rehab and I was on my bunk bed and I remember thinking, I'm 32, I'm turning, I'm having a birthday on a bunk, on a bunk bed in rehab. I didn't right. become a lawyer. I didn't become an actress. I'm turning 32 on a bunk bed in right. rehab. If I could have done this any other way, I would have, if I could have done this any other way. Obviously, I don't know how to do this because I'm 32 on a bunk bed and this is, would not have been my plan. Mm. So little things like that, that I would say treatment is why I started to actually look at myself. It was under duress. <laughs> you know, that's amazing because I'm looking, I'm looking back at myself when I was in that rehab in 2002, I was 31. And same, t and that was the first time, it was the first AA meeting I ever went to because I had to go okay. to as soon as I got there. But I can tell yeah. you. I remember clear as day right now when the circle came around to me and I had to say, I'm Gary and I'm an alcoholic. And I, I you know, I said it out loud for the first time. Yeah. I knew it and everyone else around me knew it. I also didn't know what it really was. I knew I was a right. raging drunk and I couldn't right. safely or normally, you know? Um, so I didn't right. know, you know, alcoholic was almost like, uh, I don't know. It was like, you think, yeah, we're alcohol. We're all alcohol. I didn't know what right. it meant. Do you know what I mean? Right. I didn't know right. how, how much of a disease it was. And I didn't realize yeah. how sick I was. Yeah. And, um, but I, I like what you said though. You like, cause when you were doing that timeline, you know, I, I thought you were, you were, you were, you felt that you were like getting out, getting over on everybody. Yeah. I'm just saying it pretend yeah. it really wasn't. You actually, you wrote it down and you looked at yourself, like you said, and you said, holy cow, there's something a little yeah. bit bigger here. Right. And you saw yeah. the timeline, like that is powerful stuff. Yeah. Right? So I was in, I was the same age as you were. I was in a similar rehab. It was a men's rehab and I thought my life was over. I said, yeah, well, look where you are. Yeah. Uh -huh. you done. Like 
you know. And no I, one's gonna go out with you now. No one's gonna right. date you. Were you no. already married? Well, no, no. But my girl. This is one of my favorite things to say. My girlfriend, who is my wife now, my girlfriend. Oh, cool. Um, so she's been through it all with me. She drove me. She drove me with my mom up to the rehab. So it dropped me off, and so she's been through it all with me. So she's okay. Well, she's seen the dark. She stuck it out. That's awesome. She's like I stuck it out, out with my husband because I know a lot of people thought I was insane. Uh, well, a lot of people. And no thought, I don't know if they thought she was insane, but they thought she wasn't very bright. And what are you doing with this guy? Like, you know, when are you going to smarten up? Like her family who I love today. And I have such a, I really love them all so deeply. And I have such an amazing relationship with each and every one of them. But back then, yeah, they hated me. They're like, get rid of this of guy, course. which, which, <laughs> which well-deserved, which I, you know, I earned, you know, 10 times over. Right. My husband's family told me to leave. Yeah. I, I His I, family. I, I, my, I, I, my brother-in-law flew down here to help me with something yeah with him get this idiot to rehab and he escaped oh and he escaped in the morning and was headed to mexico and it was a fucking nightmare yeah. and we got him to rehab and i was driving my brother-in-law back to the airport and as he was dropping me off my brother-in-law took my hand and he was like you can leave yeah. you can leave i just need you to know that we know you've done what you can Right. Don't let him drown you. You can leave. We'll love you. You're an aunt to Thomas and Kennedy. You always will be. You can leave. Yeah. That's and I said, yeah, I understand. I'm probably not going to, though, but mm. thank you. They told me to leave. His sister is like, what do you do? <laughs> Just mom. This, this is the recent one he was missing. This is recent. Yeah. One? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Yep. It was really, 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 really bad. My husband is, he's the, he's, you know, addiction, I feel like can be in degrees Yeah. and I've never seen, and I've been around really bad addicts, right? Like I was homeless for a long time. I've been, you know, I've been to jail. I was in, I only went to county funded facilities. I never went to like a nice rehab mm. and I've seen really the worst of the worst in terms of addiction. And he, he had, he has a bigger habit than anyone I've ever met in my entire life. His, his habit was on the small side, $300 a day. I mean, wow. like 30 pills a day. He's a pill person. Like I've never seen anything like it in my life. Just I, so yes, but that was the recent one. And yeah, they told me to leave also, but I'm glad she stuck it with you. She stuck it out with you. And I'm glad that that had a happy ending for both of you because, you know, not everybody in my life understood why I was staying, you know? Yeah. No, I, I think same with her for sure. Not to speak for her, but yeah, I think, you know, today they're allowed to, they're able to see, I guess, you know, it's a good thing that we did stick together. And then of course, you have 18 years. years. Yeah, 18 years. We've been married for a lot, 15, I think, total. I think so I'm going to get myself in trouble with that one. But um, we have two babies now. But, you know, I, I'm glad to hear your husband's doing great now. You said he's, a, you know, his best six months in a while, right? Yeah, yes, in a very long time. If, and actually, that's funny what you just said about I'm going to get myself in trouble. So <laughs> we have dedicated, this just happened yesterday. Sundays now are the day that, like, we do things together. Right. And so in my head, I call it marriage day and yeah. we just, and, and like, I've got podcast day, I've got studio day, and then I've got like marriage day and we, we were signed up for yoga together and he was like, okay, so I'm signed up, you're signed up. And I was like, yeah, okay. Yay. Marriage day. Well, he's on my phone and he just looked at me and froze and I was said, what? And he was like, how long was I, how long was I using? And I said, like a year what why and he was like oh my god i'm so sorry i i could have sworn we got married in may it's sunday wow. and i was like no 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 no. we did get married in may not our anniversary i have i guess only internally been calling sundays our marriage day sunday is not our marriage day it's oh, in may guy, and he was guy. like oh my god i was like <laughs> how <laughs> fucked up was i i did not know our anniversary was on oh, was on, isn't that so funny and I was like, oh, no, 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 I'm sorry. I guess I never said marriage day out loud. I have been calling Sunday's marriage day. Our anniversary is Sunday. You're right. And he was like, holy shit. I was like, how damaged am I? I right. really thought our anniversary was in May. Isn't that funny? That is funny. Poor guy. Oh, I, feel I poor. know. He's probably yeah. crushed him. Oh, but he probably yeah. felt better when he knew he was all right. Good. I, I Yeah, no, he was still right. right. Yeah, was, totally. Yeah. Right, so let's get back to where, to yeah. where you know, the name of the podcast is chasing heroin, right? Yes. And I yes. think it's incredible for people to realize, you know, we are bouncing around about a bit, which is great, you know, but you know, you started, you were very adamant how you had a, a lovely childhood, right? And then you did have mm -hmm. the, 
and your parents split up at a very difficult age, he crushed you and your brother, right? And you know, from 17 to 31, even, right, is when you're yeah. 31, you're yeah. 31 years old and you pick up a heroin addict, a uh, heroin habit, and you're yeah. homeless for four years, correct? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's about that. I mean, and, and I, I say that because it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't lost upon me that you this very recently were asked to speak at an opening of a recovery center. And I, and yeah. I think that's the the beauty of, of this recover out loud community. And it's the, the beauty of the transformations that we get to see every single day in the rooms of sobriety and recovery. totally, so, I mean, speaking to other people about recovery is my favorite thing to do. My, I especially, and I don't know that this will ever change because I have nine years and my heart is still so with the person that thinks that they can never do it and yeah. is either in active addiction or in the first 90 days of what is their fifth relapse and their fifth time in treatment. That's where I live. My spate, my head and heart live there, I think, because that's where I lived for so long. Like I can really still connect in that space. And so I feel like that's where I'm the most powerful is when I can get a hold of someone in that space and say, I understand you. I, I, I am you. And it did work. And it's, I love that you brought up the name of the show. So it's chasing heroin, but heroin with an E not heroin, like yes. the drug, right? Because I found that I found the best version of me through my active addiction and recovery. And I was so embarrassed and so ashamed to be in recovery. Even this time, even this time, I didn't talk about it publicly until I had two years. And yes. I called my friend Barbara, who was my maid of honor later when I got married. And I was like, hey, bro, I'm going to post on Facebook my thing, my two years. I need you on the phone right now. You need to heart it and say, like, congratulations. Right. We need to get this going in a positive direction because I'm scared. And we sure. got off the phone and like 30 minutes later, and I was just sitting there and 30 minutes later, she was like, you gonna post it. She's very Southern. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm doing it right now. Like, I didn't want anyone to know. I was so embarrassed at one of the rehabs I went to. They would, they had meetings on the beach mm. and we'd sit around a bonfire and they would sing happy birthday to people. And I had taught in that area because I also through my using all the way until I became homeless, I got certified to teach spin and yoga in 2008. Yeah. So I was a cocaine addict and, you know, probably drank too much, but I cocaine bad is super different from heroin bad. And mm -hmm. so I got certified to teach spin during that time. I got a job at the Beverly Hills country club during that time. I got my SAG card during that time. I got on a TV show during that time. Like I still did some things, which is also what I would point to later with yeah. the whole, I've only been an addict for 10 months gig. Cause look at, I got my SAG card when I was on Coke, like it's fine. Right. But dur I was so, so I had taught in this area, the area where we were going to that beach meeting, I had taught at really nice studios and now I'm this homeless person. I've been missing from people's lives. And they would sing happy birthday. And I would dive behind the other girls and be like, shut the fuck up. People know this is y'all, y'all covered in tattoos. Everybody's vaping. Everyone on that boardwalk knows this is an NA meeting. It's clear. I don't want anyone to see me. Right. They would tag each other on Facebook and be like, here at the Surfside meeting and yeah. tag me. And I'd be like, don't you dare tag me at that NA meeting Ugh, with your vape. Get out of here. And I was yeah. so upset that somebody would see me. And so like for me to have changed my mind and put myself under a logo that says chasing heroin and not, a, not only just change my mind, but you've seen some of my videos and TikToks. Oh, I yeah. talk about like really gnarly stuff. I talk about dropping a needle in a porta potty and using it anyways. Right. Like I've gone as far as you can go in terms of what you talk about. And the reason for that is that I discovered in the earlier years of my recovery that my heroin addiction, not even just Coke alcohol, but my heroin addiction was the best thing that ever happened to me in my entire life. And I'm so not ashamed of it anymore. I'm so grateful that it happened. I wouldn't change anything. I would change one thing. I got a scar in jail that I hate. Mm -hmm. Other than that, I wouldn't change anything. And I, it's important to me that other people who are stuck in that space of thinking I'm such a loser hear someone else's story and testimony that I'm so grateful for it. And if we can see that the society is available in meetings, not mm -hmm. just the bars, right? There's so there's there's a, a quicker path to success for you here if you can see that it is actually great and cool and that it's not something to be ashamed of. And the reason I even feel that way about heroin is this is a story I've shared before. So the guy that I was living with in in LA that had asked me to move out when, you know, the night of the election and all that stuff. 
he told me once we were arguing and he was upset with me for doing coke. And, you know, I said to him, I was like, look, man, you're seriously overreacting. And I was 28. I said, you're seriously overreacting. Okay. It's not like I'm doing heroin. It's not like I've ever been arrested. It's not like I'm homeless. I haven't got fired. It's fine. And he said, you know what you mean? You're right. None of those things have happened. And you're slick enough and you're smart enough that none of those things probably will ever happen. But you'll spend three days out of every week sick. You're always broke. You're always about to get fired. But worst of all, you'll have to live your life knowing you're not the woman you were supposed to be. But you're right. You could do that. He said that to you, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did that resonate? Did that hit you? Because. Yeah. Yeah. Not then. Well, it it had to have because it went in my head and I remember it clearly. I can see where he was standing. I remember what he was wearing. So yeah, clearly it's still there. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a hard thing to listen to. And I didn't realize he was right until I finally got completely clean and sober Mm. and became the best version of me. And I realized that he was right. I could have done that cocaine alcohol dance forever. Yes. You know, and kept a job for 18 months because I'm talented, but I'm not consistent. Right. I could have done that or it wasn't consistent. I could have done that cocaine alcohol dance forever. And heroin forced me to choose the side of life. And mm-hmm. heroin is where my true power was as a human being, as a person. And so that's why I'm so grateful because heroin took partying off the table for me completely. I had to choose abstinence, recovery, spiritual path, giving back all the things. And right. that's where I'm, that's what, how I became best able to serve in the world in my role. And I'm so grateful for heroin in particular, which is also how I stopped being mad at that guy that introduced me to heroin. I'm not right. mad at him at all anymore. I hope he's okay. You know, like it's fine. It wasn't his fault. I was already kicked out of another place for doing coke. Every boyfriend I ever had was mad at me for doing drugs, you know, like you know, you, you, you're you bringing up some things within me, like the, the word term grateful alcoholic was told to me early on. And, you know, it sounded I, so dumb, right? I'm like, like, what are you grateful? Listen, well, then listen. you're a nerd and yeah, I'm not I'm calling, so. I'm calling BS on that. Like, you yeah, know, uh-huh. fine. Good. We're not drinking. We're here. But don't tell me that you're happy about it and you're great. Right. Yeah. Right? yeah. Right? But just like all the signs, all, all the sayings and all the quotes on the walls, they started to slowly make sense yeah. to me. It never made sense when I first got there. Now they all make absolute sense to me. But being a grateful alcoholic, I, I am actually, I can look at you totally. right and say, I am without a doubt, a grateful alcoholic. Totally. And even though I didn't have the heroin, but cocaine is is something that I, I never said I was grateful for it, but I always often say like it sped up yeah. my it sped up my demise, if you will. It sped yeah. up uh, my bottoms. I had multiple. Totally. It sped it all up. And so without that, you know, like you said, I, I haven't thought about that in a while. I could have fought this for the, my whole life. You know, I could have survived maybe and not died maybe and lived a long, miserable, right. unhealthy, disgusting, no morals, um, no integrity type of life. Right. But I became... You know, I found out I was an alcoholic and I went and surrendered one point and I'm a great alcoholic yeah. today. Were you a whiskey guy? What was your drink? Everything. Were you a Jack and Coke guy? Everything. Like uh, it okay. was, it was just, it, de- it depended on the, you know, I go through, you know, I go through blocks, you know, I love okay. beers, but then I'd go to vodka and then, yeah, you know, okay. and then Jack, yeah, Jack, I went through all the Jack and Coke, okay. scotch, just, a, I could drink anything. Okay. You know, okay. You know, um, but so you, you, you're, you found that you're a grateful heroin addict, which is amazing. Mm-hmm. Tell us about where, what happened when, you know, what was sort of one of the last few ones where it kind of brought you to your knees, if you will. So I was living in a sober living. So I would, I had figured out a way to beat a UA, a year analysis. Mm-hmm. And so I could live in your sober living and be using, I couldn't pay rent, but I could, pass a drug test until right. you made me leave for not paying rent. So I had figured out a way to pass drug tests. And so I was in a sober living. I had gotten kicked out of that program where we would go to the beach meetings. I'd gotten kicked out of that. And I was in a sober living and I was strung out on meth and heroin, but passing their UAs, their urine drug tests. Mm. And on New Year's Eve of 
2014, December 31st, a friend of mine. So a guy that my first heroin connect ever actually had gotten busted and done like two years in prison and he got out and he was doing really well. He's actually still doing pretty well. Um, and he, he found, he came to find me basically and was like, you know, I'm out, whatever. And so, um, he had taken me out that night. He was in a sober living that he had paroled to. And he took me out that night to like a Chili's for New Year's. Mm. And I was using. And they drug tested me that morning in the sober living. Because it's clear when someone's using, right? Like I'm picked up. I'm strung out. I'm in the bathroom for 45 minutes at a time. I can't pay rent. I don't have a job. Blah, blah, blah. So they're trying to catch me all the time. And I was always ready to pass. So I passed that morning. And then that night he took me to out to Chili's. And the owner of the sober living called me. And said, hey, Janine, you left some heroin in the bathroom and you can't come back. And I said to me, I was thinking, did I leave heroin there? Like, I need that. Fuck. Like, I must, I was very messy with my drugs sometimes, which is weird. I would leave like a little chunk of heroin on this or like not a chunk, but like a uh, like a smear or like some uh, like a crystal rock. I kind of was bad about it. But. I said to her, I said, you don't know that that was my heroin. Eight other women live in that sober living. We're all in recovery. That could be anyone's. I passed a drug test for you this morning. You do not know that that was mine. Right. And she said, you're right, Janine. You did pass a drug test this morning. And I don't know how you've been doing that. But all the other girls are here. And they're all pretty sure it's yours. And I'm pretty sure it's yours. But I tell you what, if you can bring me a blood test that says that you're clean, you can come back and I'll support you. Mm. Which no one had ever asked me for a blood test before. And I said, fine, I'll bring you one tomorrow. And she said, okay. <laughs> so we get off the phone and I'm like, fuck, to my friend, I can't go back. So he got me a hotel room that night. He got me like a Motel 6 room. And before he left, I was like, hey, let me see your phone. I need to Google the hospital logo and I just need to see what a blood test looks like so that I can make this document. I was going to kick. I have a Suboxone in my purse. Like I had a half a Suboxone in my purse. I was like, I was going to kick. You know, I just need to make this this blood test document. And he was just kind of staring at me and like, I had run dope for this guy. Like he had supported me a lot. And I've been very lucky. There are a few men in my life that I used with that really looked out for me huge then. And when they got clean and tried to like find me again and help me and support me. And and he was one of them. Mm -hmm. And he backed me up no matter whatever crazy shit I was saying, you know, and like he's someone that I could have said, I'm dope sick. I know you don't want to do this because you're clean, but can you take me to get the, and he would have been like, yeah, let's go, you know? And yeah. as I was saying this, he was just kind of staring at me and I said, dude, don't look at me like that. I, I, I want to kick, but I can't kick outside, you know, like she's, I don't want to forge this document. She's, she's making me forge this document. What am I supposed to do? And he said, I mean, you could get clean. And obviously people had said stuff like that to me before. And I just sat down and I thought, oh my God, should I do that? <laughs> like right. I am trying so hard to make drugs work for me. Right. And they're not. I am trying so hard to destroy my life. I've been homeless for four years. I'm trying so hard to make this work, but I had dope on me and like any good heroin addict, I wasn't going to waste it. So I wasn't ready right then, obviously. So he left. And the next morning I called another connect of mine and said, I got kicked out of my sober living. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know where I'm going to go. And he said, well, I have a place that you can stay. You can stay in the doghouse in my backyard. And I said, really? That's awesome. Thank you. I'll be right there. So my friend had come back and of course he didn't want to take, I didn't tell him I was going to be staying in a doghouse. I just said, take me to this backyard. And right. so he drove me to this alley and I jumped out and it was actually like a little, a shed, like a small shed that his dog would sleep in. And he let the dog go inside and let me stay outside. And he padlocked me in at night and I stayed in a shed, not to keep me in though, to keep people out from me wow. from when I was in there. So um, I know everybody kind of is like, uh, and I'm like, no, no, no. He actually wasn't like kidnapping me. I did have to ask if I could leave though. <laughs> I said, I was like, I'll be right back. And he was like, you coming back, right? And I was like, yes. Mm. And he like, let me out. <laughs> so I don't think that I was kidnapped. Right. But, um, so anyways, um, it was more to keep people out. So I stay in this shed and I had a San Diego reader. There's a free crossword puzzle that I would do when I was tweaking on meth to like make sure my brain still worked. And I was a really bad picker and I had a compact with a light on it 
And I could hit him in his armpit, which is, I think, why he was letting me stay there. He was an older addict. He was like 63. And he'd been doing heroin for a long time. And he had no more veins. But I could hit him in his armpit. So he was like letting me stay there and um, bringing me dope. And we were hanging out. And and so the last night that I was there and I had this compact, I was picking my face and shooting heroin and smoking meth. And the last night that I was there, another guy, fortunately in my life that has saved me is a Marine. He's retired now, but um, called me and he would call me anytime he was back from Afghanistan and see if I was like alive. He had introduced me to the person that I did heroin with. And so mm -hmm. I think he always felt like a, a sense of guilt, even though obviously it's not his fault, but I think he always felt kind of bad about that. Yep. And he was back from Afghanistan and he called me and said, Hey, I'm at 29 Palms. I'm, you know, back for three months. What are you doing? And I said, I am living in a doghouse in Oceanside and I think I'm going to die. And he said, Okay, if I come get you, will you come with me? And I said, Yes, I will come with you. So there was a Burger King like near the shed. <laughs> And I told him where I was. And he said, I'm going to be at that Burger King tomorrow at nine. You'd be there. And I said, okay, I'll be there. So I went and I met him at the Burger King. I did go. I told the guy, I was like, I'll be right back. <laughs> and I left yeah. and he came and got me and he drove me out to 29 Palms and I kicked heroin for the last time and I never used again. And mm -hmm. that was in January of 2015. So I brought a little dope with me. He picked me up on a Sunday and I had enough dope to get me through Tuesday. Mm -hmm. And then I drank until the 14th. So to kind of get through the kick. So my sobriety date is January 15th. I think he picked me up on the 4th. I've looked at the calendar before it was Sunday. Mm -hmm. um, and I never used again. So that's what the last bit looked like. So first I just went to his house for two weeks mm -hmm. and he brought me back to life. I watched Game of Thrones. <laughs> I had started dating a guy that was sober and who I really liked. He was in drug court and I was texting him the whole time and I was texting my sponsor the whole time. So, and this is the other thing that I like to say. So the first time I detoxed, I had no resources. I went in there saying I had 10 months clean or 10 months as an addict. This time, and this is the benefit of going in and out of treatment and in and out of facilities and in and out of jail, I was keenly super aware that I was a drug addict. It was right. really bad. And it looked like I wasn't going to be able to stop. And I desperately needed help. Right. And I already knew my sponsor. Fortunately, she had already been my sponsor. You know, she'd been working with me over the years. And I was dating this guy in drug court, right, that I had met through a meeting. And so he said, watch Game of Thrones, which I'd never heard of. So I was like, the, my friend had a fire going and I'm like chain smoking cigarettes and he bought me shoes. One of the days he came back with like a, some sketchers and he was like, hey, I brought you some shoes. And I was like, oh, you didn't need to do that. You're already like bringing me back to life. And he was like, well, no, but I did because you only have one shoe. Oh. And I was like, no, I don't. And he was like, Ginny, and I picked you up with one shoe on. And I said, get the fuck out. No. And he was like, you had one shoe. That's why I bought these. And I ran to the little like guest room where I was staying. Yeah. And not only was it one shoe, it was a boot. It was a wedge boot, zip up knee high boot. So I had walked from the doghouse to the Burger King with one high heel on. Oh my gosh. In public on a Sunday morning in front of God and everybody at 10 <laughs> in the morning with one shoe with no recollection. So anyways, he buys me shoes. So um, I stayed there for two weeks, just like watching Game of Thrones, whatever. And then while I was there, the guy that said you could get clean. Yeah. He lived in a sober living and he was trying to get me in. Right. And the guy that owned the sober living did not want to let me live there because he kicked me out twice before for selling heroin on the property oh, to yeah. other people. And so he was like, I'm not letting her back. She's a nightmare. Right. And, you know, Brooke begged for me to come back. And some and I, looking back, I think he must have paid a deposit or something because suddenly Steve relented. And mm -hmm. said, you can come here. You got to test clean the moment I see you with his girlfriend, Shatima, did the testing right. and they knew all my tricks. And he was like, and Shatima's going to be in there when she's testing you. So right. no funny shit. OK, right. yeah. <laughs> like hands out, legs wide. You know right. what I mean? like, <laughs> we're on to your shit, man. Yeah. Yeah. So I was like, fine, 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 fine. So he let me stay on the couch and I came back and. I had done one thing right before I went to the doghouse that week. I got on Craigslist and I was looking, I would go online and see if people were teaching, if people were hiring instructors right. and send them my resume. Cause I had this great resume. I taught at the Beverly Hills country club. I taught at the first ever spin studio in Santa Monica in California. The first one ever pre soul cycle. It's called Yaz. Yeah. There was revolution in Santa Monica and then Yaz in Venice. 
free soul cycle. They were the first two and I got certified at Yaz and whatever. So I'd gone on Craigslist and there was somebody hiring a spin and bar teacher of which I taught both. And I sent her an email and she wrote back and said, yeah, we'd love to audition you. And then of course I couldn't go to the audition. It was the next day and I'm on a bike and I'm strung out on heroin, but I actually texted this lady and said, I can't make it. I'm so sorry. And now we're three weeks later. I've lived in the doghouse. I've gone to the, you know, I'm back. And I, and the owner of the sober living said, you need to get a job now. Yeah. So I emailed her and I said, I wonder if that woman would see me again, you know? And so I emailed her and I said, Hey, um, I'm so sorry. I wasn't able to make that last audition. Um, you know, are you open to me auditioning again? And that woman (laughs) became a bridesmaid in my wedding. And that is the studio that I owned. So I reached out, I bought it four years after this moment. So I reached out to her and she said, yes, of course, I'll see you again. Um, I got a ride down there, auditioned with a mix from 2010, because that was the last time I knew me. And she was like, oh, like throwback vibes. (laughs) And I didn't even know what throwback meant. And I was like, totally. And I'm like, these are the last songs I know. I had never heard of Spotify. I had never heard of Instagram. Yeah. And she was like, what's your Instagram? And fit, for fitness, you have to be on Instagram. And I was like, I I haven't done that yet, but like I will. Right. So, and that studio. So they hired me to teach a half spin, half bar. And I started taking the bus there. It sold out. That class sold out after like three weeks. The studio is a huge part of my story. I'm alive because of the studio and the women that I met there. That's That's really, that's really my life. My whole soul came from that studio. Yeah, And I ended up having 16 classes a week and a client there gave me a car when I had seven months, somebody gave me a car Wow! and at four years I bought it and that was studio cybrid. I owned it. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we renovated during COVID. We actually did, we sold it. We did really well during COVID. We did better. My husband's in construction. So we built like this big outdoor TRX area field. We rolled the bikes outside. The monitors still worked with the heart rate. The heart rate monitor still worked because the scanners picked them up we did better during COVID and sold it because I love spin and I love fitness, but I really didn't like ownership. I, I think it brought up a lot of my like homeless trauma, you know, being afraid of if memberships weren't going to be enough. Although I have a friend that was like, you don't have to be, have been homeless to be scared of not making money. And I'm like, that's true. That's fair. <laughs> but like it really fucked me up. So we sold it and I'm now the GM of another studio that that woman owns now. That I bought my studio yeah. from. Yeah, my friend Jana. So I went back to a cycle bar like we were talking about. Yes. And she bought it after I'd been there for a few months. She decided she wanted to come out if she'd gone into like a little faux retirement, socialite mm-hmm. retirement. And she wanted to come back to work and bought the studio I was teaching at. So she and I work together again now. And she's a huge part of my story. She saved my life. I met her when I had, I auditioned with 19 days clean. And mm-hmm. she was the first like regular friend I have I ever had you know she was so I'm gonna get emotional when I talk about it she was so yeah. like um not judgmental and she's like rich she was only 28 she already owned a home and she's just super successful and I was like really intimidated of her when I met her yeah. and I, over time I became not intimidated or by her at all and she was like the first person I told about my history and she didn't bat an eye she didn't bat an eye Wow. And the women at that studio were unreal. Within three weeks, they were like, when are you teaching again? We love your music. We love you. And yeah. they kept me alive. You know, like they say in 12 step meetings, y'all, you guys loved me until I could love myself. People yes. say that. Yes. I did not feel that way in 12 step, <laughs> but I felt that way at that studio. That's incredible. What a transformation though. Cause I'm, I'm just doing yeah. the timeline in my head. Right. So you get there and yeah. You know, three years later is not a long time to be. No, a, it's not. In a place, yeah. You know, yeah. Ownership. You're purchasing this, this, this business. Yeah. How does, how, tell us about that. I think. That's so, deep. yeah. And that's a really important question. And I think it's important to go over the exact details because you hear some story like that and you're like, but wait a minute, how? Like, I remember going to meetings and people would be like, well, you know, you stay clean long enough. The car shows up and the wife shows up in the house. And I'm like, no, 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 no. No car is just showing up for me, fool. I have bad credit. How did you get, did you get a loan? How did you get a car? You know, so that's a really good question. So after seven months, somebody gave me a car, right? I had saved up like a thousand dollars, which is nowhere near being able to buy a car. And a client of mine gave me an older car that her mother-in-law had been driving. She wasn't supposed to be driving anymore. And she kept driving it. 
and the client, it, you know, it was a 1999 Nissan Maxima and this was in 2016. So yeah. they, or 2015, it was an older car, but I was thrilled, you know? So she gave me that car. And then at the year mark, I finally moved out into my own, into my own place. And what I was doing though, in that time was I showed up so hard at that studio for the clients that I developed amazing relationships with the clients yeah. and they loved me and showed up for me and I showed up for them. And I didn't realize I was doing this, but what I tell people is that because when I bought that studio, I still had horrible credit yeah. and needed to get a commercial. I had horrible credit. still. I still have bad credit. I finally got a secured credit card like a few months ago. Um, <laughs> yeah. for, for, finally at nine years. And, but what I tell people is the relationships and work ethic you show today will determine your future so much more than the mistakes of your past. Because what happened is they all loved me. It almost felt like I owned the studio anyways. I did kind of run it with my friend, Jana. I was really involved. Yeah. And at the four year mark, she decided they needed to get out for a variety of reasons. She and her business partner wanted to get out. And she said, like, do you want it? You know, and what they were asking, we definitely did not have the money that they were asking. And I also, this is huge. I couldn't have done it without my fam without my husband mm -hmm. and the support of his family too. So mm -hmm. by now I, I had met him. We had just gotten married and the studio came up for sale. And I said this to him and he was like, well, maybe we could get the money from my family right. on a loan. So we ended up being able to do that. We got the money from his family. We also talked it down, 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 down. I've never released this number publicly, but who cares now? We bought the studio for $40,000 and yeah. And it had a hundred members already. It was built out, you know, 40 Kaiser spin bikes, a million TRXs, all the weights you could need, kettlebells, a lifting set, all of it for 40 grand. Now we did have to put a bunch of money into it because I rebranded it and I changed the name. But even without his family, yeah. I would have been able to get the money for my clients. So I had two clients offer to give me the money up front. And I had a client offer to co-sign on the lease. So wow. I want to be transparent and say that we did get the money from my husband's family, but I don't want anyone to hear that and think, oh, of course, family money. Uh -huh. Because yeah. without that, if I hadn't been married, I could have done it on my own, but it would have been a lot harder because Skylar did everything I needed every day on the construction side. So we needed to repaint. We needed to do all these things. And he's a journeyman carpenter. And so like in three days, he flipped the whole studio and renovated it, painted the cup, you know, put my yeah. Phoenix logo up, you know, painted it. He made everything look so nice. He did like marble countertops. Eventually we pulled up all the carpet and put down hardwood. We even switched the rooms. This is why we were able to sell it for double what we paid later. Mm -hmm. We switched the room. So the giant room had all the spin bikes and then a small room had some equipment, but right. we needed the spin rooms in a small room so that we could do half and half classes with more people in them. Right. So he built the second room. He made it a spin studio. He insulated the walls. He put in an LED lighting system, DJ equipment, built a stage to my specs um, wow. with like controllers, for, like built it with his hands, blacked all Melted. the inside. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then the other room pulled out the tears from the bikes, painted it, drilled bars, ballet bars into the ground, hung up TRXs. So he is why it was successful. I could have done it either way and maybe muscled through it. Also during COVID, he <laughs> rented a giant truck and delivered 35 bikes, picking them up, walking them off the thing, giving them to people. So during, cause then COVID happened six months later. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. then we had to completely pivot. Um, and again, it was only through the support of that community that I was able to do it. So the studio itself involved a host of, challenges and problems. Right. But another thing I say is I think one of the reasons why I was able to stay afloat during that time is because of my hustle mentality from being a drug addict. Absolutely. You know, because other people in the area froze and they didn't rent a truck and they didn't bring things out. And But I had the desperation of a dope fiend and was like, I ain't living in my car again. We're doing something today. <laughs> you know, I, I, what a great story. And I'll tell you that the takeaway, I know you're, you're saying, Hey, I don't, don't take it the wrong way. And my, you know, my, my in-laws helped. And that's not what I took at all. Two things okay, good. is you, Janine, you're the one that got that. You did that with your energy and with your love for the place. And obviously it yeah. was a huge part of your life and you made lifelong friends that are 
you know, super close to you. So it was all you. You don't even have to even talk Aww, about thank money. Thank you. Like, I appreciate I mean, that. <laughs> hey, I'm not telling, but you know, all you. And and then the second part I just want to say is, again, we just met today, right? We're hitting it off and uh, I super enjoy speaking with you. But, you know, you said, oh, is my, you know, my my dope fiend, you know, attitude. That's what got it. And I, was, I, I want to push back a little bit and say, no, that's Janine Colt. That's Janine. Yeah. That's who maybe you are. You know, it's maybe like, I was always like that. I don't know if I, I it is. It just, it's you, yeah. you know, like you did it. Okay. So like this could be this, you know, the, and I'm sure it is, but the sober recover transformation, Janine, that. Did yeah. That. No, yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, I think it's all of it, right. I think it's all of the things that I learned growing up, you know, it's even, it's even when my dad left and I, and you know, my life was really easy until then. And then when my dad left, I learned what heartache meant and, and what it looks like to give up because you're sad and what it looks like to, to work through sadness and stay afloat anyways. And cause I gave up at that time. Yeah. And, you know, and so I think that all of the things that happen to us, I know this sounds really cliche, but all of the things that happen create these versions of us where we have faced massive adversity yes. and turned the adver and worked through the adversity and risen to the challenge. And the more adversities you have, the better you get at managing them. And so, you know, a lot had happened to by that time when the studio closed yeah. and it was like the most surreal moment of my life to have the studio be forcibly closed in California. It was insane. And we'd only been open six months and looking back, I don't even, so, so but I, I appreciate what you're saying. And maybe I always had that thread of hard work. Um, I think it came from, yeah, just life. You know, you cut your teeth on life and you get smarter and you get yeah, sharper. You teeth, sure. <laughs> we all have, you our, know? we have our past and we have our journeys and it shapes who we are. Right. And all of it. You're right. And it's, you know what? It's not cliche. It's just a fact, right? Yeah. But it's just a fact. Of, yeah. It's just a fact. Right. But it's, it shapes who we are for sure. You know, that's what's the other saying, you know, whatever doesn't, you know, whatever doesn't kill us, make us, makes us stronger. Like, right. You know, that's true. I used, to, I used right. to really like look into that one, but it's, yeah. true, so, you know, but you said a few times while we were speaking over the past, whatever, since you've been here, the best version of yourself. You said that just sort of like off tongue in cheek almost, not, you know, like kind of just uh, flew off your tongue. But look at you now, you know, and, and I said it before, now you're being asked to be, you know, the main speaker at a recovery center opening, you know. Right. Yeah. How do you go from. I know you had the moment when you were two years sober and you, and you called your friend and you put it out into the world that, hey, I'm sober, but. How do you go or how do you become or how do you, when you have the realization that, you know what, my story can help people. I want to help people. It's who I am. And, you know, cause now, you know, recover out loud, you're, you know, a pillar yeah. of the recover out loud community. How does that happen? That's a really good question too, actually, because I have people DM me sometimes and say, I want to do what you do. I want to do speaking and, and, you know, how do you become someone that's doing speaking and I'm still working on it. You know, I would like to be able to do it full time. But for me, it started with sharing at 12 step meetings. Mm -hmm. That was the first way that I became aware that I could speak power to recovery. Yeah. And when I would share and afterwards, because I couldn't even, so I've always been like, I debated in high school and I, so I would speak on stages and I would do things like that. I always like knew that I was good at that kind of stuff. I wanted to be a lawyer. I wanted to be like a, a litigator. Right. So I knew that I was kind of good at that stuff. And then I was good at teaching. People love my classes, the way that I explain things. So I knew that I had the ability to speak. And that's certainly like a, a, a gift that I feel like I've been blessed with sure. in terms of making it recovery. I just slowly started at that sober living I was the secretary on Monday nights and I just slowly started sharing because I just felt like I had nothing to say because I couldn't ever stay clean. I couldn't do it. And so why would I talk? You shouldn't listen to me, actually. <laughs> and then finally, when I had like, I don't know, 60 days, 90 days, I started very hesitantly sharing. Yeah. And afterwards, people would say, thank you for saying that. Yeah. That really struck me. And, and I, you know, when I took a year afterwards, people are like, that was really great. Thank you. Blah, blah, blah. And so I started seeing that I could do the two, that I could speak in this realm as well. Right. And getting asked, then you get asked to lead a meeting, right? Yeah. Yep. And so I started leading meetings and then I really got involved in HA. HA is the fellowship that I'm the most involved with, which is heroin anonymous. Mm -hmm. And I got involved with HA 
And I started my show during COVID, during the lockdowns. I wanted to start telling stories and I wanted to make recovery stuff a bit funnier. Mm -hmm. And because that's kind of my, the stories are insane, the shit that happened. Yeah. And so- I wanted, so I wanted to start, you know, my show and I did, you know, started in August of 2020. And then the first real thing that happened was that they asked me to be a speaker at the world convention of HA in Atlanta in 2021. So I recorded one of my somehow, because like the more you lead meetings, the more this stuff starts to filter out and up. And so the people that ask me, how do I get started? If you're someone that's in recovery, there's a great place to start. Start sharing and leading meetings and someone's going to hear you and ask you to do something else and ask you to do something else. And so I got asked to lead an HA meeting or HA World Convention in Atlanta. And then, you know, through the podcast, people asked me to be a guest and, you know, posting videos like this, you know, if you make a reel, like I'll share it. And then it just kind of has grown from there. It's still not where I want it. You know, I, I the last, the big gig I got was at Cal State San Marcos, California State University San Marcos. Mm-hmm. They asked me to speak at their arts and uh, arts and fall. What's it called? Arts and sciences lectures or something. Right. Um, and I, so I led, I, that was an hour paid talk there. And again, just posted about that, you know, I'll have it all on my website. So that's how it was starting at 12 step meetings and hearing people respond. And then, you know, DMs on Instagram, like you and I were saying off air, you know, people reach out to me all the time and they're like, I relate to you so much, blah, 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 blah. I love the way that you say things. So all of that stuff is how it started to, and then TikTok really took off too, because I never considered the social media component of anything as being something I had any success with, Right. but with TikTok, it did well. And so that was when I started thinking too, oh, okay, I can also do social media stuff. I can do trends. I can be funny. I can do these skits where I make fun of sober living. Right. You can be you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What I think is funny. You know, what I think is what resonates with me about recovery. Like I, I was telling another friend of mine that's in the recovery podcasting space who also thinks the same kind of stuff for funny. What resonates with me is, you know, like Brad with sober motivation will post something that says, you know, double tap if you're sober on a Sunday and it feels great, but yeah. uh, right. okay. that's great. Sure. But what I love is junkie memes who will have a needle, two rigs, and one is really black and one is really light because it's the rinse. Right. And it's like for Valentine's chick, you give your girlfriend for Valentine's day, you give your girlfriend this one. It's the dark one, not the wash. That's funny to me. That resonates with me because I was a gutter hype junkie, you know? And so I wanted to put all that stuff together and it did start doing well on TikTok. Now it looks like TikTok's going to get banned, but that's when I started leaning into the whole like social media aspect of things. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> well, it's amazing, you know, obviously. And when you get those DMs, right, Janine, that's when you know, like, okay, you know what, what I'm putting out to the world is, is yeah. helping some people. Right. And then totally you get more, you know, you get more sort of revved up in a way like me too. When totally. I totally, first- this wasn't on my radar either, my, you know, doing a podcast, but when I, st- you know, the DMs on the side and people across the world, well, London, yeah. like, wow, this, that's pretty cool, you know? And it's super you know, cool. It's super all- cool. Yeah. Especially if you get one from somewhere else, like I got one from, I've gotten one from Ireland. Yeah. My show does really well in Kuwait. Nice. Yeah. Maybe. Or like, yeah. You know how Chartable gives you the records? Yeah. We're like top five in Kuwait Keep in alternative Kuwait. health. Keep going. Like, Be a I don't know who the fuck is listening community. out there. <laughs> cool, man. Resonate. I know. Is that crazy? <laughs> well, where can we find you, Janine? Where's yeah. the best places to find you? So chasing heroin, heroin with an E across all platforms, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, Facebook. Now on TikTok, I will say though, just, this is so annoying. Just chase, just search chasing hero and look okay. it up. Cause if you type in heroin, even with the E, it mm. says your community violation, it won't let you go. So okay. just chasing hero or my Instagram bio has all of my links. Um, and then also, as we were saying, I just recently became the co-host of a new show that I'm really excited about called self-help junkie, which is not a recovery show. It is. So in my spin classes as well, I always bring some sort of personal growth and development component as well to classes. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, recently I was talking about building self-esteem on the bike by making, keeping promises that you make to yourself. You already made one by showing up now that you're here. Can you add a gear, you know, that kind of thing. So like, 
Yeah. So those types of topics are what Arlena and I are talking about. So we have a meeting and then a live or we have the episode releases and then we have a live Zoom meeting with the people that listen to pop on and go over the tasks. We also give like actionable tasks each week for whatever the topic is. So self-help junkie also on all platforms, self-help junkie podcast on Apple, Spotify and everywhere and it all in my bios too. Awesome. And we will put all of those links in all the show notes and across all socials when, when this comes out and we, uh, Jeannie, I say this a lot, but we need to do this again. I really enjoy Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Like I could talk to you all day and um, what a story you have. You're helping so many people. I am uh, I'm a pleasure, right? Three times, third time really is a charm. Third time's a charm. Exactly. Third yeah. time's a charm. <laughs> I'm super, super grateful for you and all that you do. And I'm really glad that we, we hooked up today. Me too. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. All the best. We'll talk soon. Thank you for tuning in to another powerful episode of the Begin Again podcast. We sincerely appreciate your time and support. We hope that today's conversation has ignited a spark within you, affirming that recovery is not only attainable, but can also be a wellspring of strength and resilience. Our ultimate goal is to make a difference in someone's life every single day. By sharing these stories of redemption, we strive to empower you and inspire you to unlock your fullest potential, facilitate positive transformations, and contribute to creating a better future for yourself, for your loved ones, and the world at large. If you know someone who can benefit from listening to our show, please share it with them. And if you resonate with our mission and feel compelled to do so, we would greatly appreciate your support through a five-star review, following us on Instagram, and subscribing to our YouTube channel, The Begin Again Podcast. The more positive reviews we receive and the wider our message spreads, the greater our collective ability to help others realize that change is possible in their own lives. Thank you once again for being a part of our community. May you be blessed on your own journey of personal growth and transformation.